Welcome to the Art of Healing podcast, the podcast that is dedicated to helping you connect with your mind, body, and spirit. This is Charlize, physician and Reiki master, and thank you so much for joining me. I would like to remind you that although I'm a physician, the information you receive in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. You can find my full disclaimer at my website, www.healingartshealthandwellness.com. If you like what you hear on this podcast, sign up for my weekly newsletter, check your show notes for more information and for the link to sign up. Thank you. Hello, Art of Healing podcast listeners. Thank you so much. And for YouTube watchers, thank you so much for joining me. As promised, we are starting season three off with a bang, I believe, especially as a practicing internal medicine physician who probably writes 10,000 prescriptions a day. Um, I am so fortunate and so lucky to welcome for the first of season three, my guest, Dr. Tran Nguyen. Dr. Wynn is a board-certified geriatric pharmacist. In 2017, she founded Mimosa Health, LLC. Her mission is to provide expert advice in the use of medications by older adults, promoting healthy aging, and educating seniors about polypharmacy, as well as medication safety. Guys, this is a pharmacist who really knows her stuff. I'm going to continue to emphasize it. I don't know if there's many podcasts who are going to have a pharmacist on that's willing to take questions. Currently, she is a consulting pharmacist for skilled nursing facilities and a fellow in training at the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. Dr. Wynn is a radio host of the Medicine Cabinet Show, which is a broadcast every other Saturday at 5.30 p.m. Central Time from the Vietnamese Public Radio Station in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. She's the author of Medication Management for 50 Plus book, which was published in 2018. In addition, Dr. Wynn has multiple medication safety seminars for seniors at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of Oklahoma State University, MAPS 3 Health and Wellness Center, Sunbeam Family Services, Villages OKC, and local churches. For the listeners, as always, I will make sure to include in the show notes the links for Dr. Wynn's website. So if you're listening on your phone, you should easily find some show notes on any of those listening platforms, Google, Stitcher, um, Podcast being all of those, where you'll simply be able to click if you're wanting to find links about her. So those will be on the show notes. So after you're done listening, if you want those, I will also encourage you, if you're not already receiving my weekly newsletter, to sign up after today's visit. Dr. Wynn has been gracious enough that she's willing to take questions from the audience. Guys, take advantage of this. You got a real deal pharmacist here. Dr. Wynn, thank you so much for joining me. How are you this morning? I am well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for inviting me to speak to the, your audience. Uh, I'm honored. Thank you. And I know I just finished uh, bragging about you, but is there anything else you want to share about yourself before we launch into some of our, our questions? Well, I I just want the listeners to know more about their medications, know more about vitamin supplements, uh, know more about stuff that your doctor might not tell you. So um, I, I understand it is not a perfect world, but together we're going to learn. Uh, we're going to improve. We're going to improve our health care. Uh, overall, that's my goal. Wonderful. Well, once I started reading about Dr. Wynn and everything she does and the fact that she's a pharmacist, and I'm a practicing internist, so I see sometimes over 20 patients a day. And if I were to calculate how many prescriptions I write, I kind of want to lay down in traffic. I mean, it's, it's, it's a necessary part, but when I think about interactions, what's happening, and um, it's not until the end of a visit that a patient brings out the bag of supplements. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's in that bag? 
And then we pull out the bag and there's labels and there's things I've never heard of. And they come from all over the world. So I cannot emphasize enough how important her time is with us. So my first question I have for Dr. Winfrey Tran, um, I was reviewing her website and I got completely engrossed as I started uh, reading about her work. She had done a blog post. She did a blog post. It was in uh, September of 2020 about vitamin and supplement in- interactions. Um, and so just off the top of your head, can you think of um, common vitamins that or supplements that could interact with medications? Maybe something you deal with in your practice now that you often need to intervene on. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> there are many types of drug interactions. So um, I, I would, before I start into vitamin drug interactions, I'll give you some examples of other drug interactions. So we have drug drug interaction. We have drug vitamins interaction. We have drug gene interactions. We have drug disease interaction. We have drug herbs interaction. We have drug alcohol interaction and drug food interaction. So there's much more than just uh, vitamins interact with medications. But today we're going to focus on just one part of uh, drug interaction, which is Dr. Davis asked me about drug vitamins interaction. So if you're taking Coumadin and then you go to Coumadin clinic, guess what? Your pharmacist, your Coumadin pharmacist or Coumadin physician will ask you about what food you eat, uh, especially vitamin K in the green vegetables. So that's one of the famous example of drug and vitamins interaction. But uh, many times physicians or pharmacists might be uh, not telling, might not tell you that um, drug can reduce the effect of vitamins on so so drug will <clears throat> so for example if you take uh, a proton pump inhibitors uh, prilosec nexium very popular medications for your stomach uh, over over t- uh, for if you take more than four weeks or eight weeks so that should be the time that drugs works really well for you but if you take more than t- 12 weeks you start losing vitamins such as magnesium, iron, calcium, and your bones will have issue. You will have nausea, vomiting, or you may have anemia. And um, a lot of uh, patients that I have seen in nursing home have those issues. They have uh, anemic issue or they have infection issue. So if you long uh, on a long-term uh, use uh, proton pump inhibitors, you may discuss with your physician about that. So um, so if you take vitamins to supplement that side effects, that might help you, but that's not the point. The point is to help you to get off proton pump inhibitors by um, teaching you eating healthier so you don't need the medication. And that will lead to de-prescribing later on. Uh, We can discuss more about de-prescribing medication. So uh, for you listeners, um, here in the United States, we've got the proton pump inhibitors are over the counter that uh, Dr. Wynn spoke of. So those would be Nexium, Prilosec, even Zegrid has a form of those. And she's exactly correct. I know I was aware of this, but as she's talking, I'm taking notes because as a practicing physician, I take for granted that some of us are taking these proton pump inhibitors for three months, six months, two years, 10 years at this point. And I'm treating osteoporosis and these other things. And um, this is a very real challenge is helping someone come off a proton pump inhibitor. This is a very real challenge. Um, are there any others you can think of other than the, you said the vitamin, Coumadin and vitamin K and proton mm-hmm. pump? Is, is there any others that come off the top of your head? Um, so mainly when we talk about vitamins, we can talk about um, food. So food have vitamins in there too. So you have, for example, if you're taking an antibiotic, 
right? So if you have a good pharmacist, usually that pharmacist will counsel a patient to avoid iron or calcium when you take certain antibiotic because calcium or iron might deactivate your medication. Uh, so may reduce the effects of the antibiotic that you are taking. Uh, so when kids taking amoxicillin, usually I will advise moms not to take with, with milk, but with just water. And then you avoid, you don't, you don't avoid milk for that day, but you just uh, separate out uh, two to four hours apart between milk or vitamin supplements with your antibiotic. So that's another popular uh, interaction between vitamins and medication. Okay. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, Dr. Wynn is a published author and her, and um, please correct me if I'm not saying it's medication management for 50 plus. Is that correct? Yes. That's my book that I wrote in 2018. So for you listeners, because you all are all over the planet, her book is available on Amazon if you're wanting a copy. And I think you might want to pick this up because, as you can tell, she has so much knowledge to share. Dr. Wynn, in your book, you offer advice for people taking multiple medications, especially those older than 50. Is there one piece of advice you'd like to give your listeners who are over 50 taking multiple medications? Mm -hmm. I a uh, one piece of advice I will give to you is to um, avoid taking drugs that you know that will interact with each other. So um, I in my book I advise patient to make a calendar to talk to a pharmacist and say which medication I should take in the morning, which one at noon, which one at night, and which one I should not mix so I can rearrange my time to take those medications. Uh, what I see with um, patient in nursing home or in the community, every morning they have a bowl of medications. They put medication like in a bowl and then they 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 take those medication like they eat food, and it is not good. Imagine you mixing multiple chemicals in your household together. It won't turn out nice. So same thing when you mix a bunch of uh, medications or chemicals together in your stomach. It won't be nice at all, right? So... So from my book, I'll teach patient, hey, when you take this medication, you have to be sure you don't mix with another medication that you know for sure that there will be a bad interaction. It might be okay with minor interaction, but if there's certain uh, medication you have to avoid, um, I'll give you an example for drug-drug interaction. So if you take a cholesterol medication like simvastatin or atorvastatin, and suddenly you have an infection, so your physician might give you a, a fluconazole for a yeast infection. So with this two medication, fluconazole and simvastatin or statin drugs may have a serious serious drug interaction. So your pharmacist say, hey, would you hold on to your statin drugs until you finish your fluconazole therapy? And at that time, you're going to move your schedule, move your drug out, and then make sure you take the medic your uh, fluconazole as directed. And when you finish it, you will put on your uh, regular medication. So, so make a schedule just like you make a planner for your um, medication, not just the pill box, um, but really plan it out so that you can avoid drug interactions and you avoid ER visit uh, because many ER visits are due to drug interaction and side effects. It kind of, um, it makes me think of in a busy clinic week and our, our interactions with patients, um, prescribing has become such a common thing that it's it's really taken for granted. And I've, I've been in practice, it's nearly 20 years, but I can remember when I first started seeing patients, um, writing a prescription was a big deal. It was such a big deal. Now, and who knows how many I've written, now it's become, it's casual. So casual that patients often call the clinic and say, hey, I got this condition, send in a prescription. 
And it just really drove home when you said that fluconazole, which often, uh, you know, women will often call saying, I have a vaginal yeast infection, send in fluconazole. And, and just in that casual, like, oh, send it in, we could overlook if she's taking Lipitor. And this is, it's a little scary because this is happening like real time. That's a little bit scary. Um, for my next question, you, you had mentioned de-prescribing. Can you tell us what is de-prescribing? Mm. So there's a website called deprescribing.org if you are interested. So um, deprescribing is to help patients get off medication that not necessary anymore. So physicians have to evaluate the patient and see if the patient really need that medication for long term. Or do you use that medication to treat the side effects of another medication instead of that's a real medical condition? It may sometimes just a side effects of another medication. I'll give you a, an example. So for a patient on a proton pump inhibitor, right, for long-term proton pump inhibitor, so certainly uh, the patient will have nausea or a patient will become anemic and start losing the bones. So you're gonna, you're gonna add Foxamax on the regimen. You're gonna add, uh, promethazine on the regimen. You're gonna add, um, iron on the regimen. So certainly you treat one medications, uh, you treat one conditions, uh, which is stomach upset, and then you add three more onto the regimen. You're going to have four medication total, and w- three of them are not really necessary. So what you're going to do is you're going to um, check with a pharmacist and say, hey, I want to get people off this uh, this list of medication what can we do first? So first of all, we're going to help patient to um, eat well so they don't need uh, stomach medication or we're going to help them to reduce the dose. So most people will not like to get up their proton pump inhibitor, inhibitor right away. So you're going to reduce the dose uh, from 40 milligram. You're going to reduce to 20 over two weeks, three weeks, however you want. And then see if the symptom get better. So they don't have any nauseous uh, symptoms anymore. You can say, hey, you can get off nausea medication. And then uh, check that their uh, iron level, see if they're still anemic. And then you get start slowly get them off. So that would be helpful in long-term care. We use uh, to, uh, we de-prescribe a lot of antipsychotics, antidepression, anti-anxiety medications. So that what we de-prescribe in long-term care. Uh, but in the community, there's so many drugs that you can de-prescribe for the patient. Um, the, the, uh, the problem with this would be if the, the patient go to different physician, go to different specialist and take duplicated medication. So for example, I go to you, I have my stomach hurt, I have PPI. I go to another physician, I'll say my stomach hurt, they'll give you, uh, I'll get a Pepsi. So a different class of uh, medication that treat the same condition. So from there, you can see that's a duplication of therapy, that two medication from two different class that treat the same condition, from two different specialists. So we need to sit down and de-prescribe those. So do you really need a PPI or do you need a um, H2 uh, antagonist. So that's how we deprescribe. We de- deprescribe duplication of therapy. We deprescribe unnecessary use of other medication. So, um, and for the listeners, that is so important. I hope what Dr. Wynn just said really kind of sunk in because um, currently in American medicine, what's happening is that we are getting multiple prescriptions that are very similar from multiple specialists. Unfortunately, and if you have even beyond two or three diagnoses, the chances that you're seeing two or three specialists in your primary care doctor, it's really high at this point. Um, for someone who might be in that scenario, um, can you advise them, like, what's the approach? Like, should they ask their pharmacist first or should they ask their primary care first? How, how do you advise your 
um, for the average person, it's like not in a care facility, but it's like having to navigate this on their own. I would、uh, talk to your pharmacist first and really sit down for, with a pharmacist that say, "Hey, I want to get up some of this medication. What advice can you give me?" And then they can help the patient、uh, to navigate through. Usually, if a patient come to me, I will ask, "Do you still have that symptoms?" I have patient on an antidepressant for years, and she have no、uh, depression symptoms. It just one time she was on it because her spouse passed away. And that's only for short term. And physician was so scared to get the, her off that medication. So I talked to her. You go talk to your physician. You have no more depression symptoms. You need to slowly get off that medication. And she did. And the physician was so happy because now she, he feel more confident to deprescribe her after she talked to a pharmacist. So please talk to your pharmacist and write down was was their recommendation and bring it to the physician. And one problem I encounter is physicians is really、um, feel that pharmacists step into their comfort zone. So I just want、mm-hmm. to be clear that you might get into physician that not agree with pharmacist recommendations, and、yeah. so you have so you patients have to become your own advocate. For your medications, for your regi- medication regimen, for your health, so you have to understand what you need to do to connect pharmacists and physicians and you into a collaborative healthcare. So,、um, on the physician side of this, being a practicing physician, knowing lots of physicians, there is a. How do I want to put it? There's a, a mentality、um, that goes on the physician side, and、uh, there's sort of a feeling among physicians of you don't want your patients to suffer, and you don't want them to have any symptoms. And then it just goes so far that you you go into sort of an avoidance mode, and then even worse is you You come to believe that they can't ever have any 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 suffering. So you start with one prescription, then you up the dose, and you add more, and you add more. And、uh, something I often bring up to patients when they bring me a symptom, especially someone who's already on multiple medications. Once the symptom, once well, they trust me, I know it's not a red flag symptom. This isn't something that's an imminent threat to your life. It's not going to take your life. It's an uncomfort. I get that, but that's that's all it is.、Um, do we need to treat it? So, once we talk about the symptom, and I, I get an idea, and this is nothing that's going to be a red flag, an emergency. How much of it do I need to treat, or is there an option of something else that we can try? That's not not a prescription, but.、Um, Yeah, there is so much to unpack in that statement you just made. I don't even know where to start. I hope I can get you back on the show,、um, <laughs> Doctor. It's so, it's so, yeah, listeners, and I hope you all understand. Once again, I want to emphasize having a pharmacist that you're listening to right now. This, this is rare. A pharmacist are kind of introverts, so this is very rare, you guys. So you should really be absorbing this. Um, Doctor Wen, you are in the public though, and you have a radio show. Can you tell the listeners about your radio show? Oh,、uh, uh, yes, it is a Vietnamese radio show. So I educate Vietnamese seniors about medication, just like what I talk to you. I just say it in Vietnamese, and I teach them the medications because they, because of the language barrier. You know, if they visit Dr. Davis and Dr. Davis speak English to them, they may say yes, I will take the medication, but have no idea what to ask the doctor,、uh, especially American doctor. So they have a language, a cultural barrier. So I, I assume you,、um, your listener across the world will might encounter the same problem. So having、yes. a pharmacist speak your own language is very helpful, and that pharmacist will explain it. To you、um, about the medications, about drug interaction and side effects, so they feel more confident when they take that medications. Or they might say, "Well, I might not need that. I might just change my diet to get off that stomach medication, or my I might take some magnesium supplement to help with my nausea instead of 
taking nausea medication every day. So little things, little tips that I give them every day、um, in our own language, so that they they understand, they feel more, they not feeling left out for the from the healthcare because that's the issue right now is the language and the cultural barrier in some of the hospital or clinics or、um, so that's that's the issue that we have to help resolve. And once they understand that,、um, then next time they see a physician, they feel more confident to ask. I teach them how to ask a physician about medications, so that that what I do on my radio show. That is amazing. I absolutely love it, and、uh, particularly when I am working with my patients that don't speak English, this is extremely important because I just have to factor in that even if we have a translation service, like sometimes we're lucky enough to have a translation service in the clinic, that's still a barrier. It's just not the same, and then we're crossing cultures. So I have to even take into account that what I think is going to work in American healing. It does that work in Vietnamese healing,、mm-hmm. and I, it may not. And very, yeah, this is re- really, really tough. Oh, I just love that. Thank you. So,、um, Doctor Wen has some YouTube videos, and she she gives some nutrition advice.、Um, and if you don't mind me asking, Doctor Wen, you had、um, shared on your website how to make bone broth. <laughs> Um, can you share with your listeners like what bone broth is? Why why you feel so important enough that you wrote about it? I grow up eating soup every single morning. Um, so my mom、uh, cooks soup for me every single morning to the point I hate it. You know, there's one time like, why mom? Why you make me eat soup? I don't eat bacon and bread and um. Eggs every morning, like many others do. I eat soup. That's how I grow up. So I'm very picky about the soup.、Um, and my mom teach me、um, how to know the difference between the soup. So if you go to a Vietnamese restaurant and you order some soup, you can tell which restaurant have a better recipe than the other. So what they put in there、uh, is that the real soup or just a fake one?、Uh, you can tell the difference when you start eating a lot of soup. Um, your body just feels so more energized.、Um, so we cook soup.、Uh, we, we use bones.、Uh, you can, if you are vegetarian or vegan, you can use different kind of、uh, vegetables. You can put in there. So you don't have to make bone. Broth. You can make vegetable broth.、Uh, it's the same concept. So you extract vitamins、uh, and minerals out of those.、Uh, so in the bones, there's a lot of calcium, iron, magnesium, phosphorus、uh, in the bones and the bone marrow. In vegetables, if you pick、uh, some vegetables, they have. Uh, vitamins and minerals in those vegetables too. So you can put carrot, you can put celery. Celery have a lot of、um, sodium.、Uh, carrot, you can put um, um, other whatever vegetables you love. Put in there, chop it up, put in there, and you just. Cooked it, and until though you can extract it out, you don't have to eat the bones or、uh, whatever you don't want. You just need the broth. So that's how、um, it make me feel good、um, every morning when I before I go to school.、Uh, so those ideas, just like when you go to the hospital, they give you an IV bag. What's in an IV bag?、Mm-hmm. Saline. And a bunch of minerals, and、mm-hmm. that's how you you feel good when they infuse you with those minerals. So you feel good when you eat、um, bone broth or vegetable broth. You feel really good because those vitamins uh, uh, come into your body, and you hydrate yourself. So that's the benefit of bone broth. And there's different way to make bone broth.、Um, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, you can YouTube it. There's so many YouTube videos that teach you how to do it. If you want to do bone broth or vegetable broth, and、uh, kind of what I wanted to ask Doctor Win that because we were talking about like a pill for an eel, so that's kind of a cool concept. So maybe like learn how to make your own bone broth. It sounds like that might be good for something like a cold. A sore、mm-hmm. throat, maybe.、Yes. Um, might be good. Like maybe if you've had like a,、um, you know, stomach、mm-hmm. virus and you've been sick, sounds like、mm-hmm. a bone broth would be、That's、easy what, to digest. 
exactly. Mm. And this is the secret ingredient I put in there when I make bone broth. You have to put ginger. You have to put uh, onion. Um, so ginger, onion, and if you have lemongrass, I grow my own lemongrass. So I put lemongrass in there. So ginger, uh, lemongrass, onion will help to um, they infuse the heat. So they will heat up your body when you drink the broth. So those are the medicine in um, Eastern medicine. That those are the secret ingredients that you. Put into your broth. So if you don't have time to make the broth, you can make ginger tea. Um, you put a little bit of honey. It's the same concept. You infuse the heat into the water that you drink. That will help to uh, get help you get over the cold really quick. So um, that's uh, so when you cook broth, make sure you put a lot of vegetables in there and also ginger, fresh ginger, into your broth. So this sounds really yummy, and I think I'm actually going to try this. Are you still doing the the soup in the morning, or have you stopped every, that as an adult? You every day, every day. I yeah. love soup. Uh-huh. I love soup, and um, uh, so either soup or tea. Either way, if yes. if I don't drink, uh, if I don't eat soup, I can feel like I feel dehydrated. I don't drink lots of water, so that's the way to, to get my uh, yeah, yeah hydrate myself. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Tran, you have uh, some goings on, and I'm, I will emphasize to the listeners where to find you worldwide, but locally you have some courses and some programs. Do you mind sharing with listeners who might be locally who could attend how, about what's going on? Yeah, so my next class will be on October 31st. Uh, it will go through uh, OSU, the Oklahoma State University, the uh, program for seniors. You, it is free for the community, but you have to go into the OSU OLI website uh, to register. Um, that will be easier uh, to interact. And then if you local in Oklahoma City, you can uh, come and see me. Uh, if not, then you can um, follow Dr. Davis and uh, get my information. So, um, Tran, Dr. Wynn, um, I I can tell how valuable and important this show is. For you listeners, what I would say is that um, this is a show you'll probably want to share with your friends and family, and you can tell them, I found a podcast that had an internist talking and a pharmacist talking, and I think you really need to listen. So this is a shareable show. So please share on your social media. Please share by your email. Um absolutely sign up for my weekly newsletter because in a few days after the show goes live, I will be emailing a link where you can download the show and listen to again. And in your show notes, I will put Dr. Wynn's contact info. I'll put her link for Mimosa Health, the way to find her. And I'll put a link as well for her book so that um, if you've heard this knowledge and you're feeling like this is important, or if you're a caretaker and you're having to take care of someone taking multiple prescriptions, you can be empowering yourself right now. Um, Dr. Wynn, any final comments for us? Well, I, I just hope that uh, our health care will change when pharmacists and physicians and patients can collaborate uh, working together and, uh, and find a solution, it's not a, a pill for every ill, but maybe other solutions out there uh, such as integrated medicines, um, such as lifestyle medicines, such as functional medicine. Mm-hmm. So there's options out there. So I don't want patient just thinking about a, a medications for every single symptoms. I want patient to understand this is a journey, a journey to learn more about the z- disease that they have or the chronic conditions that they have. But at, at the same time, it's a journey to learn. Um, so just like when I start teaching, I realize I am also a student also. So I learn every day. I keep improving myself uh, and discover uh, simple things that I can teach my patient. And I want you to understand that um, there's always help out there, but you have to open your mind and your heart to learn and then to make sure you want to change 
because physicians can help you for that acute moment, but chronically you have to treat yourself. So learn how to cook, learn to eat healthier, and also learn to open your mind and your heart. So that's what I want to share with your、um, listeners, and I hope that you're gonna get something out of this podcast. So, listeners, thank you so much for joining us. I am already going to be plugging for Dr. Wynn to come back. I hope she'll find time to come back.、Um, I have opened the form for questions, and I'll put links if you have further questions for Dr. Wynn. And maybe if we're lucky enough, she'll come back. I do want to emphasize: this is a practicing pharmacist who is advocating for patients. Sharing her vast knowledge. This is rare, so let's please take advantage of this. Art of Healing podcast listeners, thank you so much for joining me. Check your show notes for all the details. Sign up for my newsletter if you want to get a direct link to download this episode. I will be back next week for a new show, and I wish you all health and wellness. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the Art of Healing podcast. Once again, this is Charlize. You can find out more about me at www.healingartshealthandwellness.com. Did you know I have a blog as well as online courses? Check your show notes to sign up for more information about healing arts, health, and wellness. Thank you. Please feel free to share this episode with your friends, family, and loved ones.